I'd like to welcome you all for coming to our presentation tonight, God, Delusion or Truth. Tonight's program is introduced to you by Northumbria, Islamic, Northumbria University Islamic Society in conjunction with IDC, Islamic Diversity Centre. And it is part of the Northumbria University's Diversity Week. Now, the intention of tonight's program is to put forward some discussion on a very important topic in our society, which is atheism and the belief in God. In fact, many of us wonder, what is the purpose in our lives? And even, is there a purpose, some people might ask? Or are we created for nothing? In fact, tonight's program, we are going to discuss some extremely important and, dis and touch upon some thought-provoking questions like, does God exist? Do people need religion in their lives in this society? And we're going to tackle head-on the issue of atheism as a worldview and how or why people might become atheist, followed by a short reply to the the book written by Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion. Now to introduce our speakers, we have two guest speakers here. Um, the first one is Hamza Andreas Georges. I think I've pronounced that correctly, almost, I reckon. Um, he is our um, first guest speaker who will be talking about Does God Exist? Now Hamza is an international speaker on Islam, a writer, a lecturer and intellectual activist. He is particularly interested in Islam, politics, Western and Islamic philosophy. Hamza has debated many prominent academics and in intellectuals and delivered presentations across the world on various topics. And Hamza will be talking about, as I mentioned, he will be doing a 60 minute presentation on Does God Exist? Our second guest speaker, Abdurrahim Green, who has been to Newcastle many times, a Muslim convert or revert from Catholicism, accepted Islam many years ago and is now a well-respected international speaker on Islam, teaching Islam to both Muslims and non-Muslims around the world. He is in fact the coordinator for, or the founder for the organization IERA. And the lecture he will be presenting to you all for about 60 minutes is, do people need religion in our society? So, without any further ado, I'm going to ask our speaker, guest speaker Hamza, to start his presentation, inshallah, and then we will ask Abdurrahim to follow then. I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God. In Alhamdulillah, was salatu, was salam ala rasulillah, amma ba'd. I greet you all with the Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace of God be upon you all. Now I'm going to discuss one of the most difficult topics we have ever encountered in human history. Does God exist? Are we here for nothing or are we here for something? Similarly, it's a very important topic because the topic on the existence, existence of God forms the foundation for religious worldview. Christianity, Islam, Judaism and many other spiritual traditions that we know of in the 21st century. This is why it's so important. It's even more important for the Muslim in order for him or her to demystify their way of life to the wider community. Because many Muslims say, I do this because God said so. Now many people think this is a crude perspective on life. However, hopefully by the end of today, you will understand that this simple, profound reasoning is pegged on something very intelligent, very rational. Because... God, if He does exist, is all-knowing, all-wise. Human beings are obviously not. Therefore, it's just more rational to follow what He says. Now, how do we approach the topic? 
I think we should approach the topic in a Quranic way. The Quran is the book of the Muslims. So what does it say? And I think it has some good advice, timeless advice for human beings. It tells us to think. The Quran is a book that's intrusive. It wants to go right inside the mind of the human being and right inside the soul and the inner psychological dispositions of humanity. How does one do this though? I come from a psychology background, I studied in London and as a psychologist what do you do? You ask people questions. How are you sir? He seems very fine to me. The Quran does exactly the same thing. Do they not reflect within themselves? Asking profound questions. Have you not seen the camel and how we created it? And thus do we explain our signs in detail for those who reflect. Now in the Arabic language, this word for those who reflect doesn't mean being a desert romantic, touching the sand and just looking at the stars. No, it actually means the thing that you're reflecting upon, you must inquire about its implications. What does it mean? to understand that there is natural law. What does it mean when I have an internal feeling that something must exist? What does it mean when we give purpose to material things, but yet we do not give purpose to, Im to immaterial things like our consciousness and our own minds? So the Quran points the way to thinking and reflection, and the arguments for the existence of God are going to be based upon the Islamic Quranic view. Think, ponder, Reflect, meditate, understand. Everybody ready for the journey? <laughs> okay, I'm going to use four arguments for the existence of God. The first one is that God makes sense of the origins of the universe. The second argument is going to be God makes sense of the order, the design, the fine tuning of the, of the universe to allow life to exist. The third argument is that God makes sense of morality, of objective morality in the universe. And the final argument is going to be that God makes sense of the miracle of the Quran. Okay, the first argument, God makes sense of the origin of the universe. Now brothers, sisters and friends, we have all asked the same questions. Where did the universe come from? Why does it exist rather than nothing? This is why the famous German polymath Wilhelm Leibniz, he wrote in his famous essay, the first question which should be rightly asked is this, why is there something rather than nothing? Now typically, atheists have said that the universe is eternal and uncaused. This is why the famous atheist philosopher David Hume, he said, how can anything that exists from eternity have a cause? Well, if we reflect upon this proposition, we will argue that it doesn't make sense. Because if the universe was eternal, that would mean our history is eternal, is infinite. But can we have an infinite number of anything? I would argue we can't for the following examples. Example number one, say in this room, we have an infinite number of people in this room. An infinite number. If I take two people away, how many people do we have left? Well, an infinite number. It doesn't really make sense. Example number two, say I have a hundred balls in this room and I continue to add another ball at each moment. Can I do this and make the number of balls an infinite amount? Of course not, because at every moment I could still be adding another ball. So these are the examples to show that the infinite doesn't really exist in the real world. And this is why the German mathematician David Hilbert, Hilbert very famous, he said, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. In other words, the thinking human being. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But brothers, sisters and friends, events, history 
are not just ideas, they're real things. So we cannot have a forever history, an infinite history. There must have been a beginning. This is why the leading cosmologists and philosophers of science, such as Ellis, Kirchner and Stoger, they say, can there be an infinite set of really existing universes? We suggest that on the basis of well-known philosophical arguments, the answer is no. Now, this is philosophical babble, some people may say, or some kind of philosophical abstractions. What does science say about this? Well, I would argue this is also confirmed by science itself. According to physics, we know this thing called the Big Bang. Everyone heard of this? And I'm sh I'm, I assure you it's not a thing that happens after too many curries. Now, according to the Big Bang, I got more laughs in America, by the way. I just come back from... I just come, it doesn't show how shallow Americans are, of course, it doesn't. Uh, but you can infer what you wish. I came from America yesterday, so I thought it might work for you guys. Anyway, according to the Big Bang, all of matter, physicality and energy and time were created at a single moment. According to the four prominent scientists, J. Richard, James E. Gunn, David N. Schramm and Beatrice M. Tinley, they described the event of the Big Bang as follows. The universe began from a state of infinite density, space and time were created in that event, and so was all the matter in the universe. Now, what does infinite density actually mean in the English language? It means nothing. This is why Cambridge astronomer Fred Hoyle, he states that the universe at a point in the time was shrunk down to nothing at all. So the Big Bang model requires us to believe that something was created out of nothing. But brothers, sisters and friends, out of nothing, nothing comes. This is why Anthony Kenny, a professor at Oxford University, he says, a proponent of the Big Bang theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came out of nothing and out of nothing. But even the famous atheist David Hume, he says, I never asserted to absurd proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. And in similar light, the eminent physicist Sir Arthur Eddington, he also states, the beginning seems to present insuperable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural. Now, what is the nature of this cause? We understand there must have been a cause, but we need to do something called conceptual analysis, some thinking to understand what this cause is. Now, I would argue this cause must be one. Something we need to think about very carefully, according to two aspects. The first aspect is according to the philosophical principle of Occam's razor. What's Occam's razor? It basically tells us, do not multiply entities beyond necessary. It makes no sense. Why have two? Why have three? Why have 999? It makes no sense. Well, the best and simplest explanation is the cause is one. Similarly, the cause must be one because if this cause has creating powers, then how can there be two creators? If there was two creators for a single universe, surely it must have been a slightly more disordered. So an ordered universe indicates there must have been a single, single designer, something we're going to discuss later. Two, this cause must be uncaused because we've discussed the absurdity of an infinite regress of causes. Because if we say, who caused the cause that caused the universe, then we could ask the same question. Who caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Then we could go again. Then who caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? And then I'll be sounding like a rapper. Now the <laughs> point is, the point is, if we have this kind of view on who caused the cause ad infinitum forever, then we would never have creation in the first place. So the reason that we have creation means it must have been an uncaused cause. Three, significantly, number three, this cause must be immaterial, beyond creation. Because if this, you say this creator or cause is part of creation, then you're saying Creation or the universe actually created itself, which doesn't make any sense. Similarly, this universe must, this cause must be eternal, without beginning and without end. 
as non-eternal things, in other words, material and matter, are subject to decay. They decay. But since this cause is immaterial, it cannot be subject to decay. And therefore, it must be eternal. That's why some traditions who say that God is part of the universe, or is part of matter, was a human being, or is an alien, or is something, cannot be the case. Because things that are material are subject to decay, therefore they cannot be eternal, but it necessitates that this cause must be, be eternal. Now the fifth point, which is probably, in my opinion, the most awe-inspiring moment when you find this information out. This cause must be personal. It must have a personality. The reason being, how can an eternal cause from eternity bring into existence something that has a beginning like the universe? The only explanation, brothers, sisters and friends, is that it must have brought this universe into existence, must have chosen. And choice indicates having a will. And a will indicates having a personality. Also, if we think about immaterial things that we know to exist, such as, such as the mind, we know minds have causal capabilities. Just lift your right hand, for example. You don't have right hands? <laughs> there you go. So we could summarize the argument as follows. One, whatever begins to exist as the cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. But in my opinion, brothers and sisters and friends, I think the Quran, the book of the Muslims, actually summarizes eloquently and magnificent, in a magnificent way the thing that we've just been talking about now. The Quran says in chapter 52, verse 35 to 37, Or do they think creation came out of nothing? Or were they the creators themselves? Or did they create the heavens and the earth, the whole universe? Indeed, they have no firm belief. My second argument, God makes sense of the fine-tuning, the order of the universe to allow life. Now, we all believe that natural laws exist. And we all believe that not only they exist, but we can observe these patterns in the universe. For example, if I were to drop this piece of paper, what does natural law say? It's going to fly? No, it's going to fall because of the laws of gravity. But how do we explain this? Now, to claim that they exist without reason, in my opinion, is absurd. And this is why I would argue Professor Roger Penrose, he explains this very well. And he says, there is a certain sense in which I would say the universe has a purpose. It's not just there somehow by chance. Some people take the view that the universe is simply there and it runs along. It's a bit as though it sort of computes and we happen by accident to find ourselves in this thing. I don't think that's a very fruitful or helpful way of looking at the universe. And I would agree with him. Because it seems more probable, it seems more likely that if a universe were to exist, it would not allow us to live. Think about this. It seems more likely that if a universe were to exist, it would prohibit life, not allow life. And let me tell you why. Because, funny enough, brothers, sisters and friends, this universe is hanging on a knife edge. The reason it allows life to exist because of a conspiracy of initial conditions. A conspiracy of initial conditions. And let's take some of these incomprehensible conspiracies into account. The first one is the expansion rate of the universe. Now if the expansion rate of the universe differed, was different by more than 10 to the power of minus 18 seconds, which is one quintillionth of a second, I never knew such a thing ever existed, there would have been no universe. And this is according to the likes of Stephen Hawking. Also, let's think about the low entropy of the universe. According to Roger Penrose of Oxford University, he states, in order to produce a universe resembling the one in which we live, the creator would have to aim for an absurdly tiny volume of the phase space of possible universes. Scientific mumbo-jumbo. But that doesn't really matter. Just think about the volume. 
How tiny is this volume? According to Penrose, the volume of this phase space would be 1 over 10 to the power of x. What is x? x is 10 to the power of 123, which is 10 with 123 zeros. Now, let's make this a bit more practical. That would mean, if I was someone who was good at darts, I would have to, with my dart, to aim for a proton, a proton, if the universe was the dartboard. That's how fine-tuning the creator, I believe, has developed the universe in order to permit our existence. Now, there's three possible explanations. One, it's just there. Physical law, physical necessity. Two, it's just by chance. Or three, it's design. Now, we can't believe it's just there, it's just physical necessity because these constants and values and numbers are not dependent on the laws of nature at all. Also, it would require us to believe that if a, another universe did exist, it would permit life again. Do you see the point? So it's trying to say to us that if it's just physical necessity, then there will be no chance for a uni universe to exist that would not al allow life. But since these values are so minute, and if you were to change them by a hair's breadth, we wouldn't have life today. So it can't be physical necessity. And this is why Paul Davies, he says, it seems then that the physical universe does not have to be the way it is. It could have been otherwise. Let's talk about chance. I would argue that it cannot be just by chance because the initial conditions are so high that it would be impossible to use this as a sufficient rational explanation. But some people turn to him and say, Mr. Georges, it could still be by chance. But then I answer that question with a question. Would it be chance if you saw a pink elephant arrive on your driveway overnight and say it was just chance? Of course not. What about if you saw a 747 jumbo jet just appear in your garden uh, when you came back from work? You wouldn't be arguing this type of argumentation. It's simply irrational. So why do you act rationally in your day-to-day -day life, but when it comes to the existence of God, you decide to be irrational? Contradiction in my opinion. Also, I would argue it's not just about chance. It's about something called specified probability. What is specified probability? Specified probability is a high chance, but it has to conform to independent pattern. Let me give you an example. Say we had a monkey in this room, a monkey, and it was typing away at this keyboard. And overnight, you come back after your coffee, you come back and you see, Oh Romeo, oh Romeo, where art thou, oh Romeo? Deny thy father and deny thy name. A Shakespearean sonnet. Would you believe that it just happened out of chance? Surely you wouldn't. You may expect things like dog, cat, tree, the, end, fish, fool. Do you see? However, since it conforms to the independent pattern of the English grammar, you would say, someone's being fishy. Someone had a copy of the keys, they opened the door, and they sedated the monkey for a while, or gave him a banana to eat a few bananas, and typed this thing himself. So therefore, we have sufficient reasons to believe that the universe was indeed designed. Let's summarize the argument. One, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. Three, therefore it's due to design. Again, the Qur'an summarizes this for us. The Qur'an, the book of the Muslim. It says, in chapter 2, verse 164, in the creation of the universe, and the alternation of the night and day, and the ships which sell the seas to people's benefit, and the water which God sends down from the sky, but which he brings to earth life when it was dead, and scatters about in it creatures of every kind, and the varying direction of the winds, and the clouds subservient between heaven and earth, these are signs indeed for people who use their intellect. My third argument, brothers, sisters and friends, is that God makes sense of the existence of objective right and objective wrong. I would like a consensus, if possible. Who believes that genocide,
killing innocent children is 100% without question, beyond human experience, wrong. That's almost 99.999% of us. But the only way we can have this world view, and think about this very carefully, the only way we can have this world view if God exists. Now this doesn't mean people who don't believe in God do bad things, no. There's plenty of compassionate, good, well-meaning, atheists, humanists or secularists. That is not the argument. The argument is the basis for our worldview. Can we even believe in such a thing as objective morality? And what we mean by objective is, for example, if the Nazis were to take us over and succeed in taking the whole world over and somehow brainwash everybody that it was okay to commit suicide, it would still be wrong. It's beyond human experience and human consensus. This is what we mean by objective. And since we all believe in this type of worldview, it necessitates God's existence. And I'm going to argue why. Because God, brothers, sisters and friends, is the only concept that goes beyond human subjectivity. The only concept. There's no other concept that goes beyond human subjectivity apart from the existence of God. So if you believe in something objective such as morality, it necessitates the existence of God. This is why one of the most influential atheists of our time, the late J.L. Mackey of Oxford University, he says, if there are objective values, he's questioning this, if there are objective values or morals or ethics, they make the existence of God more probable than it would be without them. Thus, we have a defensible argument from morality to the existence of God. Now someone may argue, but I don't want to believe in God, or I don't care about God. Then I would say to them, but if you do believe in objective morality, what is the foundations for your morals? And they would argue two things, and these are the only two possibilities. One, evolution. Two, social pressure. As Muslims and people of religion, I believe, are thinking human beings, let's interrogate this alternative. Let's take evolution as an example. What does evolution say about our morality? Or about anything, as a matter of fact? Evolution says that we're just accidental byproducts of a long evolutionary process. Our morality has evolved like our toenails and our teeth. And since our biology is ever changing according to this theory, therefore our morality will change too. This is why Michael Ruse, a philosopher of science, he points out morality is just a biological adaption no less than our hands, feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics, morals are illusory. I appreciate that, that when someone says to love thy neighbour as thyself, they think they're referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation, if you just accept the biological view for morality. Also, someone may argue, but we're human beings, we're special. But this I think is a bit naughty, because if you do adopt the biological view, if you do adopt the evolutionist stance, there's nothing special about human beings. We're just biology. Conceptually, and this is very controversial and I have to apologise in advance, and maybe after too, that according to the biologist worldview, a killing of innocent people in Iraq is not really murder. It's just a rearrangement of molecules. Think about this according to just the purest scientist perspective. And it's a very dangerous worldview in my opinion. Similarly, I would argue if there's something special about human beings and you're advocating a form of speciesism, that you think your species is better than others, without justification because you're just animals and animals don't have a moral paradigm when we see the lion ripping the neck of the deer and drinking its blood do we say it's murder no we're just saying wow that looks nice on bbc <laughs> do you see my point or we say it's just following its instincts so biology or evolution cannot be an objective basis for our morality so what's left social pressure society 
But this, I would argue, is even more dangerous because how can the changing influential structures in a particular society over time make a foundation for our morality and, and thereby making it objective? It wouldn't. Because we can see 30 years ago, some things were not allowed or were allowed. 30 years later, some things are allowed and not allowed. Similarly, when we see cross cultures over different periods of time, then we will think, where is the basis of our morality to make it objective? It's relative because it changes because of influentials, politicians, social norms, and these are in constant flux, they're in constant change. This is why if we read social psychology or social constructionism or even so so sociology, we will come to the conclusion that society changes its norms and its values. Even the term modernity, the term modernity actually means the values that you believed in 30 years ago, they're going to change now because, you know, things get better or sometimes things get worse. Significantly, brothers, sisters and friends, if we take social pressure as a basis for our morality, then we could never say that killing 6 million Jews in 1940 Germany is objectively wrong. Because there was a social pressure at that time that said it was okay to do that. But since people of conscience believe it's 100% wrong, we cannot take social pressure as a basis for our morality. And this is why... That's why... You, you, So you could have opportunity for question and answers. I don't want to understand that long. I've heard a fair amount. And, uh, so honestly, I do beg you to stay. I'll tell you why. Because for dialogue and discussion, I'm sh I'll answer any question, however repulsive it may sound to the Muslim audience. Uh, thank you very much. But we've given you the opportunity, honestly, sir. Well, why don't you educate us, sir? Why don't you educate us or enlighten us? We've given you this opportunity. I guarantee you to have the microphone for half an hour. But I think that's unfair. That's not right. Okay, I mean... <laughs> I think... Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, in all fairness, I mean, I, I'm going to make this as a, a point for us to learn from. If our communities, regardless Muslim or non-Muslim, atheist, non-atheist, whoever we are, are going to be acting like this, and I don't want to say it behind his back, but I think it's probably the worst path we can take. The worst path. I mean, how many times is the Muslim community, people are pointing the fingers at them and saying, how can you react like this because of the Danish cartoons? Or you guys are barbaric and immoral. This is not right. We're here to discuss and have a frank, open, decent, human discussion, couched in human language. And I think it's, it's, it's unfair for things like this to happen. It's not right. And I think, you know, I, I ask everybody, if anyone has even the most bizarre question that you think would even insult anybody, please do ask the question. Because the Prophet Muhammad said in a narration, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, the cure to ignorance is to ask and learn. And this is what we should do. Okay, this is why Richard Taylor, the eminent ethicist, he said, the modern age, more or less, repudiating the idea of a divine lawgiver, has nevertheless tried to retain the ideas of moral right and moral wrong without noticing that in casting God aside, they would have abolished the meaningfulness of right and wrong as well. So to summarize the argument, one, if God does not exist, objective morals do not exist. Two, objective morals do exist. Three, therefore God exists. My final argument is going to be the miracle of the Qur'an. As I said in the beginning, the Qur'an is an intrusive text that likes to tap into the inner dimensions of humanity. His aqliya, which means in Arabic his intellect his nafsiya, his internal, emotional, and psychological disposition. And we heard all the things that the Qur'an does. It likes to tease and agitate and make someone think. But the Qur'an goes further than this, brothers, sisters, and friends. The Qur'an actually, actually challenges the whole of mankind. In the second chapter, verse 23, 
the Quran says, I'll say in Arabic than in English. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you're in doubt, talking to human beings, to humanity, to the doubters, to people of different varying philosophical persuasions, if you're in doubt about that which we have sent down to our servant, referring to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then bring one chapter like it, one chapter and call on your witnesses and helpers and supporters besides God if you are truthful. Now the Mufassirun, which basically means the exegetes, those who explain the Qur'an for us historically and in present time, such as Ibn Kathir, Jalalain and many other scholars. They have concluded that this challenge has something to do with the special nature, feature, style and structure of the Arabic language in the Qur'an itself of the Arabic language in the Qur'an itself. And significantly, this came in a historical context because it's well known from Eastern and Western scholarship that the people at time of revelation 1400 years ago, they were best at expressing themselves in the Arabic language. They were Arabic literateurs and linguists par excellence, which basically means the best. They were the David Beckhams of poetry. Well, David Beckham's not good anymore. Maybe someone else, yeah? You know, they were the Bruce Lee of martial arts at the time, or something, yeah? So, they came and they were challenged, but they failed to challenge the Qur'an with regards to emulating, reproducing, copying, or imitating the style, feature, nature, or structure of the Qur'anic text. This is why the eminent linguist at that time, and he wasn't a Muslim, Walid ibn al mughira what does he say? He even swears by God, he says, by Allah, by God. I have never heard anything like this. I am the most best amongst you with regards to poetry and prose and linguistics. But this cannot come from any human being. Now, even today, we have the likes of Bruce Lawrence from Duke University in his book, The, Bio the Quran, A Biography. He says, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, layered within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. Also, the famous Dutch Orientalist, Martin Zamet, he says the Quran is the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. And we have many more. For example, Paul Casanova in 1909 at the College of France. What does he say? He says the Quran is superior with regards to cad cadence and, and rhyming and poetry. And we have others like Reverend R. Bosworth Smith in his book Muhammad and Muhammadanism. He says, the Quran is a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is one miracle claimed by Muhammad and a miracle indeed it is. We go down the list of Eastern and Western scholarship, people who are best placed to even analyze the Quran with regards to its style, structure and other aspects of language, and they conclude that it is inimitable or it cannot come from a man. Now, this means that it must be a miracle. Now, what do miracles actually mean? In the medieval period, they had this discussion of if miracles can actually exist, because we had the whole post-enlightenment and the renaissance and other aspects of Western scholarship, and they wanted to question aspects of Christian theology and Christian doctrine. They didn't want to believe in the Bible anymore because at that time, historically, the Catholic Church, well, an, an, an interpretation of the Catholic Church, used the coercive arm of the state to, pre to prevent thinking. That's why you have the likes of uh, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Puffendorf, uh, John Locke, and all these other thinkers that said, right, we need another view now. So one of the views were, for example, David Hume, he wanted to reject the concept of miracles and he defined it as violations of natural law. But this is not the Islamic position because I would argue it's irrational to claim that a miracle is a violation of natural law. Because what are natural laws? Natural laws are just generalizations of patterns we perceive in the universe. If something changes from that pattern, does it mean it's a miracle? No, maybe we didn't put our glasses on or we went for a coffee or we didn't scrutinize or think deeply about what that pattern really was or maybe we haven't waited long enough. Now, the Islamic concept of miracle is something a bit more coherent in my opinion. It is an act of impossibility. Something we cannot explain 
via nature. So when we exhaust nature, we don't find an explanation. Let me give you an example. I also need some water as well. So. Okay, the example is, say I take this bottle and I remove carefully the lid and I put it back, I give it a good shake and voila, we have Abdurrahim Green. <laughs> now this would be slightly impossible. The reason it's impossible is because how can we from the nature of the event, create Abdurrahim Green. It's an act of impossibility. Even when we go to the nature and we try to exhaust all combinations, let's shake it this way, that way, that way, or that way, <laughs> yeah? How do we do it? How? We can't even do it. So when we exhaust all possibilities, we cannot create Abdurrahim Green. So it's an act of impossibility. Similarly with the Quran, when we go to the Arabic language, the finite 28 letters, the finite words, the finite grammatical rules, and we exhaust every single possibility. Bob's your uncle. <laughs> you can't have the Quran. We cannot create the Quran. And this is why we say it's an act of impossibility, and therefore God makes sense of the miracle of the Quran. Now, brothers, sisters, and friends, how long do I have left? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Excellent. I have 15 minutes. I think what's very important to understand as well is the concept of purpose. Think about this. The concept of purpose. Because even if you reject the idea of God, that you may not even be able to prove God's existence via morality, science, or any type of philosophy and method, I would argue that the most profound, the profound Argument is the concept of purpose. Think about this. You are sitting on chairs, brothers, sisters and friends. You are sitting on chairs. And these chairs have a purpose. What are their purpose? To sit on. But chairs are, are material. They don't function psycholo psychologically. They don't have cognitive powers. Chairs cannot think or feel. Yet we attribute purpose to them. Similarly, do you know in a particular forest there is a moth and this moth, its job is to drink the sap from the tree and do you know there is another moth that its job is to sit underneath the backside of the first moth and do you know what it does? It drinks the poo of the first moth. This is the BBC for you again. David Attenborough. But this is the reality and that's its purpose because you know why? Because when the first moth eats it poos straight away. And if it was to trick it down the tree, the ants could find it and eat the first moth. So the second moth, it is backup. It's security, security guard. It's insurance policy. <laughs> you never knew anything about this moth three minutes ago. You wouldn't care if five million of these moths were to die. But yet we attribute purpose to such insignificant things. But to ourselves, we want attribute purpose? Surely. This is why the Quran, when he says, Allah says in the Quran, Ayna tadhabun? Where are you going? Where are you going? And it's important for us to think about these things. Another point to add, which I think is very amazing, is the concept of awareness. You are all aware that you're looking at a very interesting gentleman with a beard. Correct? Maybe not interesting, but a gentleman with a beard. You are aware of that fact. But significantly, you are aware of the fact that you are aware that you're looking at me. But awareness has no material basis. How can we say the self or consciousness or, or awareness comes from material? Because just like the famous physicist Schroeder, what did he say? He basically said that there's no difference between a lump of clay and the brain of an Einstein. The only difference is that the brain has awareness and consciousness which cannot come from something material. But some may argue, well, material science does have a basis for consciousness and awareness. We can prove awareness and consciousness scientifically. It's just chemicals. But I would argue you can't. Because if you do, it would be like arguing in a circle. Because it's the, the fact that you're aware and being aware and the person who was aware actually discovered science. So to say now science 
discovers awareness will be arguing in a circle and trying to bite your own tail. So the concept of awareness and the fact that we are alive is an amazing indication for the existence of God. Now, the big question comes into play. What did God say? We know that something exists, there's a knocking on the door. We don't know who it is. Did we expect anyone today? I don't know. So he has to tell us who this person is. And this leads to the next presentation by Abdurrahim Green on religion and purpose and life and revelation. I like to end by saying anything that I've said that's offensive or wrong has come from my ego. And anything that I've said that's good has come from God himself because we believe in Islam. That we are just tools that God uses to manifest his mercy and his compassion. In other words, we are nothing. The message is everything. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Unquestionably, all praises are due to God. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, well, I'd like to thank um, our speaker Hamza for enlightening us on, on such a topic. I'm going to um, invite our next guest, Abdurrahim Green, to come and talk about do people need religion in our society? But before that, I just want to um, mention again that everybody will get an opportunity to ask questions and answers at the end of the presentation, especially our non-Muslim guests, they will get priority to ask questions first and then anybody else after that. We will have the mics coming around for those who want to ask questions. So I'd like to invite our guest, Abdurrahim Green, to speak on the topic, do people need religion in our society? Min alhamdulillah, min ahmaduhu wa nastainu wa nastaghfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayati a'malina. Ma yahdihi allahu fala mudilla lah wa ma yudlil fala hadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. I begin by praising uh, Allah, God the Creator. We praise Him, we seek His help, and uh, we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with God from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever God guides, no one can misguide, but whomsoever God leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I indeed testify that uh, there is nothing worthy of being worshipped except the one God and that indeed Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is the messenger of God. Hamza finished his talk by knocking on the door and that's where I'm going to begin my talk. I'm going to go back to that knocking on the door and I'm going to ask you a question. Without opening that door over there, can anyone tell me what's behind that door? The one over there. Huh? Uh, unless you know the you know, do you, do you work here in the university? <laughs> yeah, exit and ventilation. Do you, do, are you sure though? It's a guess. It's a guess, right? But you don't really know. There could be a big green hairy monster there, perhaps. <laughs> well, maybe not. You know. But actually, all I'm really trying to do is, although our intellect is hugely important. Uh, and uh, both me and Hamza would argue vigorously that in order to understand God, in order to understand religion, uh, we have to use our intellect. And there may be other ways, but we would probably both of us argue that the intellect is uh, one of the most important tools that we have. But your intellect has a limit. And I was demonstrating there the limit of your intellect. When it comes to something that is unseen. When it comes to the unseen, all you can do in reality is guess. You could take an educated guess. But I want to up the ante a bit here. And I want to propose to you something that I'd like you to think about. Imagine that you really need to know what is behind that door. In fact, let me suggest to you as a thought experiment for this evening, that knowing what is behind that door is absolutely essential to your survival. 
Knowing what, what is behind that door is essential to your survival. And you have a limited amount of time in order to decide what is behind that door. You can't open the door. You're not allowed to open the door. But you have to come to a decision. If your decision is not right, it is going to affect your life in a most horrific way that you possibly can't even truly comprehend. That's my thought experiment. And imagine there are five or six people, or maybe more, competing for your attention, trying to persuade you that they can actually tell you what is behind that door. One of them may even be trying to persuade you that there is nothing behind the door. There is no door. The door is an illusion. There may be someone trying to convince you of that. There may be different people who are trying to convince you what is behind the door for various different reasons. But amongst those people, there is one who is going to be able to tell you the truth. I'm actually really trying to give you an example, as probably you might be aware, of different religions in the world. Often people present this argument, okay, it makes sense that there's a God, it's logical, it's rational. The most rational proposition, and I would just really sum up my opinion about uh, uh, Hamza's quite detailed and philosophical <coughs> discussion, is that the most rational conclusion of the rational mind is that this universe has an intelligent, powerful creator and that there rationally could only be one intelligent powerful creator who is transcendent who is different from this universe so the creator of the universe is different from the universe but that's pretty much the limit of what we can understand through reason and I would say that actually by the way it is one of the or perhaps even perhaps even, the most powerful argument for the truthfulness of the Qur'anic narrative. That the concept of God that is taught by the Qur'an is exactly this concept. That this universe has been created by a powerful and intelligent being who is transcendent. By that I mean that God is not like anything in the universe. And the Quranic concept of God does not compromise that in any way by, for example, claiming that some creature, such as a human being, shares the power, the knowledge, or the attributes of God. And that would be a self-contradictory statement, if you think about it. If you're claiming that a created being has any of the power of the knowledge of the ability of God, then the whole basis upon which you build an argument for the existence of God in the first place, it falls down. It, 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 it's, it demolishes itself. So that's what I would propose, first of all, is one of the most powerful arguments, one of the most persuasive arguments that a person should believe what the Muslims are saying. Because the similitude or the example I'm giving of the door is really the example of the afterlife. It's the example of the afterlife. It's also the example of knowing God. How can we know God? Through what means can we know God? Is there a means to know God? All of these questions and more. The ones that Hamza also introduced, the purpose of life. Why are we here? What is it all for? What is the reason for our existence? These are, of course, all the questions that religions in various different ways try to answer. And there is another issue, the problem of evil. Of course, this has been raised a lot recently with the earthquake in Haiti and before that with the tsunami and constantly there are these disasters and 
priests and bishops and imams and theologians and philosophers are presented and how does God, a good God, let these things happen? And of course, there are certain atheists, well-known atheists, who imagine that this is a very powerful argument, a very persuasive argument, that God does not exist. But I'm sure if you manage to follow Hamza and his arguments, you will first of all, and very importantly, realize that the existence, or what they call the problem of evil, has nothing to do with the existence of a powerful, intelligent being who has brought this universe into existence. It's got nothing to do with it. The existence of earthquakes and disasters and AIDS and human beings killing each other has got nothing to do with the question as to whether there is a creator or not. And trying to connect those two is an emotional argument. It's an emotional argument. It's not a rational argument. It's emotional. Extraordinary from people who claim to be atheists, who claim to be rational. There is no logical connection between the two things. How do you explain an organized, systemized universe? The most rational conclusion is an organizer, a systemizer. That's the gist, the very condensed gist of one part of Hamza's argument. So the real question here is why does this creator allow suffering? Why does this creator let these things take place? Why does this God create a world in which there are earthquakes and tsunamis, in which children die, in which there is rape and murder and genocide? Why? Of course, I just painted the negative things. <laughs> There's a lot of beautiful positive things as well we could talk about. Love, happiness, joy, peace, tranquility, friendship, literature, society in many different ways different physical and mental pleasures that we experience consistently throughout our lives. So we shouldn't imagine that the world is just this grim, terrible place. But the question of these evil things, as they're called evil things, is not a question about God's existence. It's a question of why. Why does the Creator let these things happen? Now again, how can we know the answer? How can we know the answer? From where can we know the answer? Philosophy here really lets us down. And all ultimately we have is conjecture. And in Arabic it's called dhan, conjecture. Well, maybe this, maybe it's an exit. Well, it looks like an exit, it's got exit written. And obvious there are some good guesses we can take. But how do we achieve certainty? This is the question. How do we achieve certainty? From where can we get certainty? How can we be sure? Well, I would propose that the only way you can truly be sure, the only way you can truly be certain as to what is the purpose of your life, what is the reason for your existence, is when the one who gave you life and the one who gave you existence tells you. It's the only way you can be sure. The only way you can be certain is when God tells you, I created you for this reason. Everything else is guesswork. Everything else is speculation. Why is there evil? And I use this word in inverted commas, evil. Why is there suffering? Why do these things exist? Well, again, the only way you can be certain is when the one who created this universe and created this world and allowed these things to happen explains to us, this is why, this is the reason why. It's because of A, B, C. But I'm sure it, in the minds of everybody here, it begs the question, all of this begs another question. How, which guy am I going to trust? I need to know. You need to know what's behind that door. You need to know. It's very important. 
I mean, let's take, let's take the options. Option one, right? It's pretty much shared by the three monotheistic religions. Option one is, there is going to be, you are going to die. And when you die, at some stage, there will be a day of judgment. We will be recreated or in some traditions, your soul will be brought before God and you will be judged. You will be asked about every single thing that you have done as the Quran describes it. Every atom's weight of good and every atom's weight of evil, you will be asked about it. The tradition is pretty common. The Quran is very descriptive about what is going to happen on that day of judgment. How will we be questioned? What will the state of the human beings, their panic, their fear, their terror, the Quran describes it, the day of judgment, as one day like 50,000 years. One day like 50,000 years. Just the day of judgment makes your entire earthly existence seem like a moment of a day. That's just the day of judgment. What is to follow is even more terrifying. There is the alternative of eternal bliss in paradise or eternal torment in hellfire. Now I told you what behind is behind the door is pretty important. And you've got a limited time to find out. The other alternative, of course, is suggested that you will be reincarnated. It may seem less compelling, but it's still pretty serious. I mean, I don't think I would like to be reincarnated as a cockroach or a rat or a donkey. I don't know. It depends where I was a cockroach or a rat or a donkey, I suppose. I mean, if I was a dog in my mum's house, I might be quite happy. Okay, but still, I don't think so. But seriously, even if you believe in reincarnation, well, how do you know? How do we know? But it's a possibility that's being suggested, or is there nothing? Do you just dissipate as energy into the universe? How do you know? You've got different people making competing claims. How are you going to sort one from the other? And uh, What do you do? I, what criterion? You know, this is a thing I would like to know. What criterion are you going to use? The Quran tells us that throughout history, God the Creator has sent messengers. This is what Muslims believe. That throughout history, throughout the human history, God has sent, God has chosen individuals from amongst the human beings to remind the human beings of the things that we have been discussing here tonight. Not only about the existence of God, of course, but also about our relationship with God, about the purpose of our life, about the reasons why God lets things happen to us and how we are supposed to deal with all of that. And also about the reality of the life to come. So this is what we believe. Muslims believe that God has chosen human beings to convey that message. And to some of those human beings, he gave books. So, for example, the Qur'an talks about Prophet Noah, a prophet, about Prophet Abraham, about Prophet Moses, who was given the Torah, about Prophet Daud or David, who was given the Zabur or the Psalms, about Prophet Jesus, who was given the Injil, and of course, who we believe as Muslims is the final Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon all of the Prophets, who was also, he was given the Qur'an. So we believe this is the way that God has revealed knowledge about himself. He has explained to us the purpose of our life, how we should fulfill that created purpose, and the reason why things happen the way they do. That's why God has sent throughout the ages messengers to remind human beings to tell them and inform them about this information. And we believe that those messengers have been given signs. So let's go back to the knocking on the door. Let's go back. Right? Someone's knocking on the door, or we give our example. We've got a select group of people. Right? And I asked the lady over there, 
who, mashallah, perked up and she said, you know, this, you know, that's the way out. What did I say to her? Can everyone remember what I asked her? How do you know? Huh? How do you know? No, I asked her. Do you work in the university? Before, yes. What did I say? Do you work in the university? Why did I say that? Why did I say this is the university, right? So let me now give you an example, right? If there's five people, four of them don't work in the university and one does, do you think your probability of choosing the right person is beginning to get a little bit more now? Yes or no? Yes. Right. But, you know, shall I just accept her claim? It's important. You need to know what's behind that door. You've got time to question. Don't say you haven't. No, no, I want to play on my PlayStation. I want to play on my whatever this thing they call. I'm listening to my phone. I haven't got no. You've got plenty of time. Believe me, you've got enough time. In your life, you've got more than enough time. Ask the question. Okay, so she made a claim. I could just say, you know, she looks an honest type of lady. You know, she really does. So she's got a nice smile as well. You know, that's, that's going to convince me. Like, you know, apparently most American, you know, you know how you get to be voted a president in the United States of America? You have the biggest smile. Apparently, they statistically, the guy with the biggest smile gets voted in. So, I don't know. Maybe he's got a nice smile. I don't know. Do I? Seriously, but it's important. This is not, this is a really important issue. So maybe, you know, I might ask her, do you have some ID? You say you work in the university. Can you prove it to me that you work in the university? She says, yeah, sure. So out of her back pocket, she pulls a pass, right? University of New... This is the University of Newcastle, right? <laughs> university of Newcastle, right? Northumbria, you see, there you go. Okay? I'm in the wrong planet already, okay? So University of Northumbria... It's written there, and there's her photo, and that sure looks like her, right? Now, how much more are you going to be convinced? Yeah? I mean, and then what if she tells you, well, actually, I, I know what's behind that door, because that's the way I take every day to my office. And, you know, bit by bit, you could get more and more convinced. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Is that there are signs. There are things that would indicate to you whether that person is speaking the truth or not. And that's exactly what we believe that God has given to His messengers. God has given to His messengers. Right? He has given them signs. They were given things that when a person sees them and they study them and they look at them, they know that these are indications that that person must be speaking the truth and they must be truly what they claim to be. It's interesting that C.S. Lewis, he gave a criterion, he said something uh, which as a principle of analysis, we Muslims happily accept. But we don't accept his premise, and I'll tell you why. But he said concerning Jesus, he said that either Jesus, and he said this in respect to his belief that Jesus is the Son of God, and presumably that Jesus is God, that either Jesus was a liar, or he was deluded, he was mad, he was a madman, or he was speaking the truth. And he says, well, if you look at the life of Jesus, and what Jesus said, and how he behaved, you can eliminate those. You can say, well, he wasn't a liar, and he wasn't, mad so he must have been speaking the truth there is of course another possibility the other possibility is that what has been taught to you about jesus is not true and the things that you claim he said he never actually said i, I just say that because although i actually accept the basic argument i don't accept his conclusions for that extra reason but let's just say it's actually a totally valid analysis to make of any claim of any individual. Anything anyone claims, anyone makes a claim, they could be lying. Lying means they are purposefully trying to deceive you. They know very well that what they're saying is untrue, 
But they are lying. They are purposely trying to deceive you. That's one possibility. And this, of course, applies to anyone claiming prophethood. I know what God says. I know God's telling me why you're here, what the purpose of life is, where you're going to go after you die. I know. How do you know? God told me. So you can analyze. Is he truthful? Is he a liar? Is he deluded? And each different person will display different characteristics. The liar, and as I'm sure you probably, most of us learn, I don't know, I learned that in my life, right? I learned that usually a lie leads to another lie, which leads to another lie, and then you have to lie to cover up the lie that came before. And you know, you could be a good lie, and maybe you could go for quite a long time, but sooner or later, the pack of cards of lies just collapses around you. Because you just have to keep on making up lies to cover up. I think most of us hopefully learned that when we were kids, right? Okay? Maybe politicians didn't, I don't know. No, no offense to politicians. There are some very, very good politicians and who are sincere public servants. I, uh, we have a, maybe an unjust view of politicians. Okay? Uh, it's just a cheap joke, really. But the point being, you know, seriously, the serious point is the point about lie, lying. You know, it has a characteristic. Similarly, a deluded person. Now, what's the difference? A deluded person is saying something untrue, but they really genuinely believe it. That's different. You see, the person who is deluded is sincere. They actually really believe it. So they could display some of the characteristics of a truthful person, right? But actually, they are either, you know, uh, you know, maybe uh, a devil or a spirit is telling them, or they have some psychological problem or whatever. They truly believe that they are receiving revelation from God, but indeed, in one way or another, they are just suffering from a delusion. And I'm sure you can understand, therefore, that the characteristic of that person is very different from the liar. Very different. But there are still ways that you can identify that. The third option, as long as we agree that what we are hearing and observing about this person is accurate, then the third and only third option is that that person is speaking the truth. Now it's very interesting because if we can apply this criterion to any man who comes along and claims that he is receiving revelation from God, that he is a prophet. Maybe we can begin to make a type of decision. Because I hopefully we would agree that let's go back to our people. You have to know what's behind the door. Right? What process are you going to use? And I often ask people this. If someone comes knocking on your door, right, and says, I've come to read the gas meter, I, I don't know here about a Newcastle, right? But I mean, in London, uh, we live in an almost, you know, I, I feel we live in an almost permanent state of fear. I, mean, I really do. You know, I haven't been outside to my garden for, I don't know, uh, quite a few days because it's been pretty cold and I was away and, uh, you know, I was on a trip abroad and I came back and sure enough, what did I find? Someone had, you know, actually crowbarred open the door of my garage and been rummaging around in the garage. It's ter my kids are terrified. My kids, but I didn't even tell them. Because they live in fear. Which is what we could come to about, does our society need religion? I think Hamza introduced that subject very nicely with the problem of, you know, how do we know what's right and wrong and good and evil? What's our morality based upon? If we don't have religion, do we even have morality? Isn't it morality therefore just a social construct? It just changes from hour to hour, minute to minute. <laughs> And if it changes from hour to hour, minute to minute, do we even have really morality? No, that's his argument. And I agree with it. We don't. It's illusionary. You need, and this is why I'm going, you need this certainty. But the certainty is important. We need to know that this is really from God. And this is our problem. In the rational age, we need a rational explanation. We need a religion that not only teaches us morality, but we can have rational reasons to believe that that religion truly is from God. And I would invite you to make that examination 
not based, by the way, on morality. Interestingly enough, I'm going to say you need to put aside morality. Why? Because it could be that our society has adopted a whole fallacious approach to morality anyway. Where have we got to? What have we concluded with? Maybe we have reached the stage where our moral compass has lost its bearings. You may say, well, Islam is immoral because of what? Because of, and then you make some pointers. You come up with all, maybe the misconceptions, and maybe those things are even true. You say, well, Islam this, and Islam says that, and Islam allows this, and Islam allows that. But your judgment is based upon what? Your judgment is based upon what? Your culture. Your present state of morality. Interestingly enough, by the way, back in the days when, well, you could, I, I don't know, maybe <laughs> there are some of us here who would say back in the days when Britain was great and we had an empire and there'd be other people who were saying, what are you talking about, great British empire? Funnily enough, I had that dis discussion yesterday with a barrister who's... Uh, who's originally her family's from, uh, from Bangladesh, not very impressed with British Empire. So, uh, But the point is, is that actually a lot of the things that people may criticize Islam for, they were things that were practiced here in Britain. It's interesting when this whole thing comes along, Muslims don't agree with British values. What British values? I think we'd probably find that Muslims have more in common with, say, Victorian values than maybe modern values, but was Victorian times less British? Was that part of Britishness? I don't know. I mean, you tell me. What's that mean? Interestingly enough, I remember a particular right wing Dutch MP. I had a vigorous email exchange with him, and he was. This was about the issue of, interestingly enough, coming up again in France of Muslim women covering themselves and wearing the hijab. And I'd list, uh, written a letter to the uh, European Parliament, you know, uh, inviting them to oppose France's decision and so on and so forth. And one Dutch MP wrote to me, and a very, very aggressive racist letter saying basic, basically what he said is, there are countries that people go from and come to, right? Morocco, you know, Somali, they are people, they are countries that people go from. They run away from those countries and they come to places like Britain and the Netherlands. Yeah? So basically what he's saying is, if you want to come to our country, you behave the, the way that we tell you to behave, more or less. Yeah? So anyway, I, I, you know, I wrote a, a pithy reply to him. Uh, you know, and he said, oh, we have to de-Islamicize Europe. De-Islamicize Europe. And that's a very interesting concept, de-Islamicize Europe. I said, do you know, by the way, um, that the numbers you use every single day, does anyone know where those numbers come from? Do you know where they come from? Arabic. They're Arabic numbers. One, two, three, four, five, those actual numbers, the actual shapes that you use, the numbers you use, including, by, way, by the way, the zero, are Arabic numbers numbers. So if you want to start de-Islamicizing Europe, get rid of the numbers. Yeah? I mean, just make sure you do a thorough de-Islamicization. Yeah? And especially the use of zero, which was unknown except in India, but it was developed into practical application by Muslim mathematicians who developed the use of the zero. Of course, algebra can you, I, you can't even imagine basic things in our society existing without algebraic equations. I mean, some of us may quite be happy, quite happy to get rid of algebra, but I think on a practical scientific point of view, we couldn't do much without it. But algebra, of course, is, is something. That the word itself is Arabic. Algebra. From Kitab al-Jabra, which was written by a famous Muslim mathematician who developed the whole system of algebra. By the way, in order to calculate the zakat, so I won't go into the whole thing. I mean, what do you mean de-Islamicize? So, I mean, my point is morality. If you're going to use the position of morality, that's not a good position to take. No, we have to go back. We have to look at the basics. And I'm asking you now to make an analysis, to look at the Prophet Muhammad, 
May God's peace and blessings be upon him. In the light of these three things, just these three things, was he truthful? Was he deluded? Or was he a liar? You could do that by reading his life. But it's very interesting. And since I don't have time, obviously, to discuss many aspects of this, I would just like to propose to you two things, just two things I want. First of all, I, it's very interesting that, of course, there is a long history of polemic against Islam. There is a long history, started with St. John, Saint, I probably wouldn't like to call him a saint actually, but John of Damascus, who wrote, wrote the first polemical work against Islam. And he said some pretty absurd things, including uh, claiming that the Prophet Muhammad died by being attacked by uh, a group of pigs. That's what he actually claimed in his writings. And he pretty much set the standard for quite a few Christian writers after his time, making pretty absurd accusations. Uh, uh, and of course, his claim is that Muhammad was a liar. Why did he say this? And why, by the way, the cons almost entirely, and I wouldn't say everyone, the Reverend Boswell, for example, is an exception, and there are others who take a different view today. But I mean, historically, probably up until 100 and 150 years ago, almost without exception, most Christian writers accused the Prophet Muhammad of being a liar. The reason they did that is very simple. Any Christian or Jew who opens the Qur'an and reads the life of the Prophet Muhammad will be struck by how much consistency and similarity there is between what the Qur'an says, what the Prophet taught, and what they know from their own religion and scriptures. In fact, some of these things are very detailed matters of theology and philosophy, religious philosophy and law. In fact, some early Christians thought that Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, was actually a bishop, a former bishop. That is the level of information they recognized to, because they have to explain where did Muhammad get all this information? Where did he learn about heaven and paradise and the hellfire and Moses and Jesus and Abraham and Noah and the detailed dietary laws and so on? Where did he get this information from? Well, he must have learned it from a priest, from a rabbi, from this and that. And then he must have what? Made it up and invented it and made this religion together. That's the only way they could explain and still obviously not agree that Islam was the truth by saying, well, he must be a lie. He must have invented it. And it's very interesting that there is another group of writers, and these writers are much more modern. And people who have now accessed themselves to the sources and have begun to read for themselves about the life of Prophet In other words, not relying upon these Christian polemicists. And they said, well, that we don't really find evidence from the life and character of the Prophet Muhammad, that he was a liar. In fact, it's extraordinary. His people used to refer to him even before he was a prophet, or he claimed to be a prophet, as they would say. They used to refer to him as Al-Amin, the truthful and the trustworthy one. And they give many examples of his behavior, of his character, totally out of character of a person who is a liar. In other words, they testify to his truthfulness, his honesty, his absolute sincerity. And that they say it's not possible that he was a liar. They say, but he must have just thought that he was a prophet. He must have really believed it. He believed it, but he was, you know, epileptic. And people who have epileptic fits, they have these visions and so on and so forth. And so they tried to explain this by saying, well, he was deluded. He thought he was a prophet. That explains his sincerity. That explains his behavior. But of course, he wasn't speaking the truth any more than the liar was. But they can't reconcile his character with being a liar. But, the, you know, the interesting thing is, you can't be a liar and be deluded at the same time. That's why there's only three possibilities. And I'll give you an example. If you are a liar, if someone comes and asks you a question, as it happens a lot in the Qur'an, a lot of the time they ask, it says the Qur'an says, they ask you, O Muhammad, they ask you about this, they ask you about that. And then the Qur'an gives an answer. 
So imagine this. Someone comes and asks the person. We're going back to our people. Imagine here, remember. You need to know what's behind that door. So they come and ask a question. Let me test. Let me see if this person really knows this. Now, if you're a liar, if you're a liar, what, you, what are you going to do? You want to give the right answer. So if a rabbi or a Christian or he's coming to you, what would you do? You, if you've got your source of information, you want to give the right answer, you're going to either construct a very ambiguous reply or you're going to go back to your source of information and you're going to find the answer and then deliver the answer. It's a lie, it's a deception. If you are deluded, you think that God is going to reveal it to you. You don't need to go and look for a reply. You don't need to go and search out the answer because you're really sure that God's going to tell you because I really believe I'm a prophet of God. Do you understand how you can't be a liar and be deluded at the same time? Yet, actually, if you try to look, where is the source of information? There were no priests. There were no rabbis. There was no one we can identify from where the prophet could have got this information. His character, as we know, and we can examine it was the character of a truthful person. I just want to give one example. One example, and it's from a vigorously authenticated source. This is an amazing example. And I just leave it for you to ponder on it. After many years of the Prophet preaching his mission, suffering incredible hardships, difficulties, seeing his beloved wife Khadija of many years die, after a boycott, having seen his followers tortured, killed, forced into exile into Ethiopia, the Muslims suffered terrible things. Eventually, a group of people in a city called Medina invited the Prophet Muhammad and his companions to come and live there. And it didn't stop. Even then, they were gathering armies to try and wipe out the Muslims. So you can imagine, this is going on for now. Let me see, by that time, must have been nearly 18, 19 years. And in Arabian society, it's very, very important, it was important in those days to have a son. In fact, they used to mock the Prophet Muhammad because he didn't have a son. He had daughters, but all his baby boys died. And it was a source of mockery of the Prophet from the pagan Arabs. Actually, what happened was, after these 17 years, he had a son. There was a son from one of his wives, Miriam. She gave birth to a son. His name was Ibrahim. And when Ibrahim was six months old, a little baby, he died. Actually, he died in the arms. The Prophet was holding him as he died. So the, this child died in his arms. And even the Prophet was crying. And they used to think that, you know, you shouldn't cry when someone dies. And, you know, they said, oh, messenger of God, you told us not to do this. They said, no, this, this crying is from compassion. It's not from disbelief in God or questioning God. It's just from compassion for my, that child. That's, that, that's allowed. Anyway, it's not the point. The point is that on the same day that his son died, there was an eclipse of the sun. So his son dies. On the same day that his son dies, there is an eclipse of the sun. Now even today, I've told some people that, and I didn't even finish my story, and they said, that's amazing. He must have been a prophet. Right? And sure enough, by the way, at that time, people came running out. They said, look, even the sun darkens for the death of the child of the messenger of God. This is what the people were saying. Now imagine this, please think about it. If you're a liar, you've been inventing all these years, trying to persuade people you're a prophet and this and that, here's your chance. I mean, okay, your son's died, but still, after all of this, you'd say, you see, I told you everyone, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Look at that. What more do you want? True or not? Wouldn't a con man, a liar, wouldn't he take an opportunity like that? No doubt. And imagine if you were deluded. You're just a madman. You're just thinking and imagining the same thing. You'd say, yes, it's a sign from God. You see, I told you, it's, I'm a prophet. God's sign. But actually, 
the Prophet Muhammad did not do that at all. In fact, when he heard the people, he called them. He called them, the big announcement. You know what he said? He said, this is the sun and this is the moon. And they are just two of the creations of God. And they don't eclipse for the birth or the death of any man. So when you see this, pray to your Lord. And then he taught them a special prayer to make when there is an eclipse. Is this how a liar would behave? Is this how a deluded person would behave? Or is this the words of a truthful man? I can only ask you, please, to, I can only ask you, please, to think carefully. There are many people making many claims and being able to claim to tell you what is behind the door. I am absolutely convinced as Hamza has introduced and as I'm sure that I truly believe many of you here today would agree that the loss of religion, the loss of a, an absolute anchor of morality in our society has set us astray as a society and is a large contributing factor to the increasing chaos that we find in the world around us. I have no doubt in my mind that society, Western society, the world as a whole, actually needs religion more now than it ever did. But where is the religion that can offer us certainty? Where is the religion that can offer us a rational certainty that is not merely based upon what our ancestors did or just some belief or maybe it just makes me feel good or that person smiled nicely. Certainly I believe that all of us have a duty as Hamza has mentioned the verses of the Quran to think deeply about these issues, to think very deeply about these issues. Of course, all we both of us have been able to do is a little introduction to all of you on a vast topic. It is our happiness and joy to be able just to stand here in front of you and share some of our thoughts, our understanding, our feeling. It, of course, is totally up to you and your own conscience, how you deal with it, what sense you make of it or not. As the Quran says, لا إكراه في الدين. There's no compulsion in religion. No one should be forcing anyone what to believe or what not to believe. But I do believe that having a discussion is important. That at least if you could understand, even if you could understand, that Muslims do have a rational basis for believing what they believe. For behaving the way that they do. It's not based upon some mere, you know, irrational emotion. That there are some, and I believe, of course, compelling reasons to believe that not only does society need religion, that Islam is something that can contribute hugely to the well-being of society. Uh, and I do look forward to that. And may God bless all of you uh, for coming here tonight. May, I, may God guide you and God may guide me also closer to the truth. May his peace and blessings be upon all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Okay, thank you for that um, wonderful presentation. Also, I'd like to um, express our gratitude to all of you who've been sitting and standing patiently throughout this whole program. Um, we are going to have a question and answer session. So anyone who would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We have Sister Ruxana there with the mic on this side and Brother Suhail on this side with the microphone on this side.